ends promptly at 12. At 12 o'clock, I'm walking out of the room. Well, the exam begins, 12 o'clock comes, he's got his stack of exams, he's about to leave, but he realizes one more student in the audience, and it's that student who hasn't made the sound all semester. So he's about to leave, but he thinks, no, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to have one last little bit of fun before the semester ends. So he sits down, and he waits. And 5 past 12, 10 past 12, 15 past 12, the student suddenly realizes what's happened, finishes up exams, goes running up to hand it in, and the teacher says, what do you think you're doing? And the student says, well, I'm handing my exam. And the teacher says, no, you don't. Your exam is late. You flunked the class. I'll see you next semester. The student says, do you know who I am? And the teacher says, it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, you flunked the committee exam. I'll see you next semester. And the student really holds his ground and says, but do you know who I am? And the teacher says, no, I don't know who you are. The student, student takes the exam, slides it in the middle of the stack, says precisely, and walks out. <laughs> <laughs> now, what makes the joke work? <laughs> What makes a joke work is, first of all, the way you think you see things is not really the way they are. The way of telling a joke is trying to convince you that the answer is over here when the answer is over there. So distracting information. And the reason this joke works, particularly with students, is because what looks like a threat suddenly becomes an opportunity, and we didn't see it. And that's the way I want to approach climate change for you tonight, that there is a change in context. And some people can see it, and some people can't. Um, without being too general, there is a generational aspect to this. Young people are coming into this saying, look at how much we have to do. And they're facing these older folks at these companies saying, this is insane, look at how much we've done. And that generational aspect really animates a lot of the focus on sustainability today. And really, I think, makes it an exciting topic to teach young people who are coming in and saying they want to have a sense of purpose sense of vocation, sense of calling, and they want to be business managers. And we need that kind of energy, or we're never going to solve these problems. The fact of the matter is that business is the most powerful institution on earth. If business isn't working on these issues, there will be no solutions. Business develops the next drive train under your hood. They develop the next form of mobility. They design the buildings we live in, the clothes we wear, the food we eat. All the answers will come from the corporate sector. Like it or not, that's where they come from. And that's why this is a very exciting topic within a business school. Now, when we look at the issue of climate change, there is distracting information out there. We can look at it through multiple lenses. We can look at it from the field of science. And here's a quote. Uh, Scientists make meaningless and ambiguous statements. Advocates and media tra translate statements into alarmist declarations. Policies, politicians respond to alarm by feeding scientists more money. The accepted evidence is consistently is, is entirely consistent with there being virtually no problem at all. But that's Dr. Richard Lindzen at MIT. Not an insignificant character in the debate on atmospheric science at a major university. But then on the other side, global atmospheric concentrations of CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide have increased markedly since 1750 uh, due to human impact. And this is the IPCC from 2007. I'm not trying to give equal weight to two sides of this issue. I'm just trying to say that there is a competition over what does the science say. We can look at the realm of politics. Over the past two hours, I've offered compelling evidence that catastrophic global warming is a hoax. That conclusion is supported by the painstaking work of the nation's top climate scientists. This is Senator James Inhofe. He said on the floor of the US Senate, he continues to say it today. And there are others who are saying equally uh, vitriolic stuff, some even worse. Um, and then on the other side, the debate is over. There's no longer any debate in the scientific community. It's an inconvenient truth. We all knew that as a uh, former Vice President Al Gore. So in the realm of politics, we can have this competition over how we think about this issue. We can even go to the realm of religion. And on the one side, global warming is Satan's attempt to redirect the church's primary focus. I believe the church must quickly get serious about denouncing the accelerating effort to promote the alleged catastrophic, taken in context, of human caused global warming. This is the late Jerry Falwell. Again, not an insignificant voice. And then we can go to the other side. I am not the one who believed in the global warming, um, uh, but I, I, again, take it in context, but I tell you they're making a convert out of me as these blistering summers, uh, and this is Pat Robertson. And so even in the realm of religion, we have a very hot debate. Uh, over the now, in the realm of business, everything I've just put up on the screen is a distraction. It's actually irrelevant to business thinking on this issue. 
the fact of the matter is, when you think about climate change, you need to think about it as a market shift. When you think about climate change in a business context, you can actually be totally agnostic about the science of climate change and still see it as a business issue. Your consumers want it. Your investors want it. Is regulation coming? Do your banks care about it? Do your insurance companies care about it? Do your suppliers and buyers care about it? If you sell products to Walmart, Walmart cares about it. Is it becoming an, an, an aspect of international competition? Look at what's going on in China right now on renewable energy. Uh, Stephen Chu calls it our Sputnik moment because the advances are made on renewable energy. It is a business issue, it is a market shift. I have up here a couple of market shifts to think about when we think about this issue of climate change. We have telephone lines, we have a, a handheld um, a telephone, and then of course we have the um, iPhone over on the side. A major shift in how we communicate. Over here, we, this device on the bottom left, how many people have never seen one of these before? <laughs> uh, this is called a typewriter. Uh, and over here, we have a laptop computer. A major shift in technology. An important aspect of this shift, how many people have heard of Oliveta, Smith Corona, IBM? Well, you've all heard of IBM. Some of you have heard of Smith Corona and Oliveta. These were the three primary manufacturers of typewriters. Two of them did not see the shift. Two of them don't exist today. One of them did see the shift, and they shifted with it. IBM used to make typewriters, now they make computers. On the bottom, we have a Walkman. Again, how many of you have seen one of these? Uh, NPR had a very funny segment about two years ago. They gave this 13-year-old a Walkman and said that how he would survive without his iPod and work to the Walkman. And he said it took him a week to realize he actually had to take the cassette tape out and turn it over and put it back in. <laughs> um, and then we have the shift to the iPod. Now think about this shift. This is more than just a shift in technology. This really transforms our society. Our access to information. Google is now a verb in our, in our society. We're expected to be able to learn anything at any time. If you have a question, something comes up, you can go to Google. Um, I can access, I have an iPhone in my pocket right now. I have an email back. People don't even know I left Ann Arbor, except that it says <coughs> this message comes from my iPhone. Please excuse uh, any typos. But it really is changing our culture. And that really is an interesting aspect about climate change, is really changing our culture through market shifts. Now, if we call it a market shift, there's a couple of questions that quickly emerge. I want to put them out there for you and tell you why they're the wrong ones. The first one, how much will this cost? Now, for the individual business, that is a different question than for the, the, the entire economy. Uh, the impact on the G GDP is notable. These are real numbers up here. Uh, the uh, uh, McKinsey, the consulting firm, puts the number between 0.6 and 1.4%. The Stern Report puts it around 1%. And the Congressional Budget Office puts these numbers up here. In the gag, these are real numbers, although I will point out that we do not know a precise way to measure GDP, and the error in GDP is more than 2%. The kind of numbers are sticking up here, just as that is aside. But for the individual company, it doesn't matter what it's going to cost the entire economy. The question is, how is it going to impact my strategy vis-a-vis -vis my competitors? And can I turn climate change into an opportunity uh, in order to improve my market position that is the question that needs to be asked in the individual businesses. How does it change the competitive landscape? How does it change my positioning? How does it change my competitors? The second question.